Hi there, welcome back to IndyCar. Now, it is, of course, uh, the first day of July today, uh, 2022, and you might be forgiven for thinking that actually not very much has changed since Nicola Sturgeon's historic announcement of last week. The announcement of the independence referendum date of the 19th of October that next year um, seemed at first to confirm something uh, that everybody was hoping, which was that there will be a referendum. However, we've had to have the buckets of cold water thrown over our celebrations of this, simply because the First Minister has decided to refer the entire matter of the legality of referendums in Scotland to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. Now, although I mentioned earlier on that the Supreme Court, when it sits, has to employ Scots law to decide on the matter, there's a very strong suspicion that the Supreme Court will rule that any referendum without a Section 30 order would not be lawful, in which case we're left with this last choice of um, going down the road of a so-called plebiscite election, something incidentally which has not ever been done before in the United Kingdom, to my certain knowledge. Now, it's worth remembering that the plebiscite election, as I pointed out the other day, has some severe drawbacks from independence campaigning point of view. That is, that we would lose a large chunk of the existing uh, referendum demographic. That would be all of the young people who currently are about to turn uh, 16 before the uh, referendum date next year. Now, those young people in Scotland, if there were, were a referendum, would be allowed to vote. They're being denied that. Uh, so that's the first demographic shift that would occur if we had to go to a general election. The other one is that the status of EU nationals who have EU passports but have chosen to settle in Scotland and have settled status or have leave to remain indefinitely, the actual status of them as voters is rather uncertain. Now, the Westminster Library does claim that anyone in the United Kingdom from the EU who has uh, achieved settled status, who paid the massive amount of money that it costs to do this, it's about £1,300 to do that, is entitled to register to vote in general elections, which you would think would probably at least ameliorate some of the problems, but it's not certain how many uh, individuals from the European Union have the status required to vote. So this throws up all kinds of difficulties for us. But not only is that a problem, if we go down the road of what Nicola Sturgeon characterised as a de facto referendum using the general election to decide on a single issue, that has also never been done before. But I don't think there's any precedent in the, the history of British democracy, such as it is, of that ever happening before. And there is also the argument that the, uh, the United Kingdom would simply argue that the many millions of people who voted or who would vote for independence parties, even if they were in a majority, the British government could argue that they were simply voting for MPs. And that conferred absolutely uh, no right on the Scottish government or the SNP or anybody else in Scotland to start negotiating independence. And I can see a lot of problems ahead if that is the only option left. But is it the only option left? Well, the answer to that is no, for a number of very, very important reasons. Now, you may have heard the term self-determination used uh, in connection with Scotland. And self-determination is the right under the United Nations Charter of all people to decide the future of their own country. Now, in terms of Scottish self-determination, that right is already there. We've also got a claim of right, a document which is basically uncontested in Westminster, which asserts the right of the Scots to vote for the former government which best suits their needs. Now, that's been accepted for years, and many people argue that we should just, if we are denied democracy, just invoke that right and end the union. The problem with this is, again, it's untried in this context, and there is the issue of recognition. You know, would uh, a de declaration of independence following the invocation of the claim of right be recognised by other countries? And the probability is it wouldn't, simply because the United Nations in particular looks on uh, countries like Scotland who want to leave larger, shall we say, states in this case, um, in a different way. I mean, you have to give the people in that particular domain, that territory, the chance to vote on whether they want to do this or not, in order for it to have reached the standard of proof, in other words, the majority in favour that the United Nations requires. 
However, there is another route. Self-determination isn't just uh, about independence. It's also about decolonization. Now, up until recently, I would have said that it would have been difficult for the Scots to prove that Scotland was a colony of the UK or a colony of the English state, if you want to look at it from that point of view, simply because it is in a treaty of union with England. It is technically, and according to the words that are used to describe the United Kingdom, a union of nations which is voluntary. If the Supreme Court rules that the Scots cannot voluntarily end the Union using a, a normal democratic method, such as a referendum of any kind, with or without the permission of the English state, then we stop being a democracy and we become a colony. We become a territory which has basically been held against its will by a larger state. When that happens, at the point which Scotland is revealed not to be in a union which is voluntary, it is in an involuntary state. In other words, it's been kept in this relationship with England against its will. In order for a colony to really demonstrate that it is a colony that's being exploited by a larger nation, we need to show that the resources of the colony are being exploited by the larger state. And that is easy to demonstrate simply because Dominic Raab yesterday very obligingly confirmed that the reason why England is stronger with Scotland is because of all our resources. He actually said it out loud that he confirmed all the advantages that having Scotland trapped in the Union conferred on the English state. It gave them all of our oil revenues, it gave them all of our gas revenues, it gave them all of the potential revenues and power from our offshore and onshore wind turbines and other devices generating renewable energy. It gave them the right to tax our whisky exports, none of which we really see the benefit of, and so it goes on. So Dominic Rubb has confirmed that England is exploiting Scotland. If the, if the Supreme Court then rules that we cannot escape from this union do, do, using any kind of democratic means available to us, and if the English state refuses to recognise a plebiscite election, then we are a colony. And in that case, we can invoke yet another one of the United Nations charters, which is the decolonisation of Scotland. To do this, we would need to then request that the United Nations sanction a democratic event. This would be a consultative referendum or a ballot, whichever you want to call it, which is forced upon England, basically, so that Scotland can have this vote. So the people here can make that choice. And if the United Nations accepts that request from the Scottish Government, and under the terms of the conditions of decolonisation, the authority in charge of the colony, i.e. the Scottish Government, whether it's an assembly, a government, even a, a local council, if it makes a formal request to the United Nations to do this, the United Nations would then basically say, right, there is going to be a democratic event in this territory. And they would check to see that the authorities in that territory have the ability and have the mandate, first of all, to call for this, which we do. We've already established that. We can demonstrate that we're being colonised. We can also demonstrate that Scotland has been held by force because we know our history. We know that after 1707 there was a rebellion in 1745 which was ruthlessly put down by military means and there followed a, a genocide and a an ethnic cleansing of most of Highland Scotland, wiping out the Gaelic culture and all of the people of the Highlands were removed forcibly by the English state so that they could put in their own people and their own sheep farms and their own grace moors and we know the rest. All of the evidence is there for Scotland being a colony and if the Supreme Court rules that we can't escape from the United Kingdom by democratic means then this is the actual route out for us and it guarantees that we will have a lawful vote. It also guarantees that it would be respected by all the members of the United Nations because under the Charter, under the decolonization of Scotland, which would occur using this technique, all of the countries which are currently members of the United Nations would be bound 
to accept the result of this, including England, which, as Britain, is a part of the United Nations, at least for the moment anyway, but it remains to be seen whether it remains so after it breaks international law by changing the Northern Ireland Protocol. So what is interesting about this is that there is a fourth option. It's an option which has not been used by Scotland because it was largely felt that Scotland was a country in a union with another country. But it's beginning to look a lot like a colony. And the definition of Scotland, if it is not allowed to vote to, to leave this union by lawful means in the UK, then it becomes an exploitation colony. In other words, it becomes a territory conquered by England, subdued by England, in which many of the indigenous people have been removed and replaced with uh, in invaders, I would say, over the history of the 300 years of the Union. They've been replaced. They've largely been ethnically cleansed from the entire nation. And that leaves the room there for anyone to migrate from the south of Great Britain into the Highlands to take over. And this is largely what happened in the 1700s. In the 1745 rebellion, which failed under Pony Prince Charlie, was the last military action trying to defend Scotland from the colonisers. And no matter which way you look at the history of it, we can demonstrate that Scotland was taken by force and that military garrisons were set up all over the Highlands, filled with English redcoat soldiers who ruthlessly put down any dissent. It's very easy for Scotland to present itself as a colonised state, particularly if the uh, Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, which is basically the... Uh, the super state, which is in this case going to be, you know, named as the colonizer, is very easy for us to do that, but only if the um, the Supreme Court rules against us. This is an interesting line of thought, which nobody really seems to have explored very far. I've seen the documents um, which the United Nations have on how this process happens, and it's actually very simple. It would all be done under the watchful eye of the United Nations observers, who would make sure that the vote was held freely and fairly. They would also make sure that people weren't being threatened, that they weren't being coerced in any way. And I also want you to remember that when the Acts of Union were signed in 1707, they were coerced into signing it. There were threats of military action. There was an army waiting in the south, south of the border at Carlisle. Um, Scots people were threatened with dispossession of any properties they held in England. The Scots uh, trading outposts were isolated. No Scottish ship was allowed to trade with English outposts, and so on and so on. We were coerced into the Union. It doesn't even bear modern uh, scrutiny, because we certainly didn't volunteer to be in this Union in the first place. And if it really is a voluntary Union, then the only thing that the Supreme Court can do is rule that a referendum of any kind is perfectly legitimate. However, I think there's a strong risk that it won't happen. And if the SNP is serious about offering us the chance to vote, then using the general election as that methodology is fraught with difficulties, with delays, with other um, roadblocks put in the way. And certainly the English state would never accept that a majority of Scottish pro-independence MPs being elected was in any measure of our collective will as a people to be decolonised, to have England's grip on our resources released and to return all that was taken back to us. So I think, looking at this logically, this is the fourth option, but it's probably the better option because um, frankly, as I said, the evidence to support co colonisation and the evidence that Scotland has become a colony, even though it's claimed that it isn't, is very, very strong. And in fact, you could support this with documented history going back 315 years. In fact, even before the Acts of Union were signed, there were coercive moves, there were threats made, there was military action planned. The Scots were not able uh, to do anything but to sign the Treaties of Union, because to do anything else would have been to cripple the Scottish economy, would have been to risk being invaded by an English army. So I, I suspect, you know, and I've said this many times, there, there are far more ways to do this than we are led to believe. But if we want the United Nations on our side, this is the most obvious way to go. 
Remember the Chagos Islands, uh, I believe they're in the South Pacific, which were colonised by the British state and used for nuclear weapons tests uh, up until the 1960s. The people of the Chagos Islands were forcibly removed by the British colonisers and they are still fighting to get back to their island because although the British state has been told by the United Nations that it must give back the islands to the people they removed, they still haven't done it. So we know the type of people that we're dealing with. But here in Scotland, we have something the Chagos Islanders didn't have. And that is what Dominic Rabb outlined the other day. We have all of the oil, the gas. We have the renewable energy. We have the fishing waters. We have the whiskey. We have the renewable energy. And a lot of other things, including fine foods and seafoods, shellfish, meat, poultry. You name it, Scotland produces it, and the English state depends on it, as Dominic Rabb admitted yesterday in the House of Commons in as many words, that they were stronger together because of Scotland's resources, confirming the fact that England is basically colonising Scotland and exploiting its resources without us being asked permission. So I think there's a very strong case if we are denied democracy in the usual way by the, by the referendum route, that the only way that we can obtain a lawful vote on independence, which the United Nations and all the nations who are signatories to that charter would respect, is through a request directly to the United Nations to decolonise Scotland and to provide a UN-sanctioned uh, consultative democratic event that the people of Scotland will be freely and fairly able to express their opinions of the Union in. It is not rocket science this. It has existed in the UN Charter for many decades. It's rarely used and it's normally used to liberate former colonies of bigger nations, particularly the United Kingdom. 63 independent countries have separated themselves and removed the British colonists in this sort of way. So, we can do it as well, and I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. In fact, if the Supreme Court stupidly decides that we cannot have democracy, then they are basically describing Scotland as a resource uh, colony of the United Kingdom. And in that circumstance, we would be perfectly entitled um, to request from the United Nations a UN-sanctioned advisory referendum supervised by them with no interference whatsoever by the British state at all. And they could enforce the rules as well. They could enforce the rules which would say that the media, the British media, is not allowed to report on the, uh, the campaigning. So it's possible for us to do this. Anyway, listen, I've got to go now. My